One. Hey, hello, hello everybody. Hello. Detroit. Hello. Yeah, <laughs> welcome to Punch and Roll, <laughs> where your favorite audiobook narrators come together to play your favorite role-playing games in a celebration of the power of human storytelling. Last session, the Punch and Roll crew wrapped up Not Another Rom-Com uh, by defeating Chad Golden Teeth and sparking love between Jenny the Baker and Sebastian Fork. And now <laughs> we pick up a new volume and open to a new chapter one where we will be meeting a new cast of characters ready to transport us with tales of adventure and heroism. So it's a novella no this time. Yeah, exactly. With no further ado, let us meet the cast of Punch and Roll Beneath the Library. And I can think of no better place to begin than with the man without whom season one would not ever have happened, uh, the technical director of Not you. Another Rom-Com, and now on-camera <laughs> cast member Spencer Dillahay. Spencer, say hi. Hey, everybody. How are you? It's good to talk to you. Yeah, Spencer, yeah, the chat is saying, Spencer has a face. It's true. Spencer, <laughs> Spencer always had a face. <laughs> Indeed. But now finally is sharing it. Um, Spencer, tell us where you are, uh, where you're calling in from, which for you I know is a bit of, a, uh, of an adventure right now. Yes. And um, tell us a little about what you narrate, either like genres that you, that you work a lot in or that you, that you love to do. My uh, my dial-in location is about to change, so don't. Uh, I could even dox myself. That's how shortly I'll be leaving here. Uh, right now, I'm calling from White Salmon, White Salmon, Washington. It's on. It's in the Columbia River Gorge. Uh, it's a beautiful place, but I'm leaving it Saturday forever, and I'm going to Connecticut. So next time you see me, I won't be here. I'll be. Oh, who knows where I'll be? Because it'll. <laughs> we moved July one, so I think our next session I'll be. I don't know somewhere, stealing Wi-Fi out of a library or something on a laptop. So who, who knows? <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> this is dedication. I love it. As, I love it. As far as the genre and stuff I, I narrate, I actually just finished, and turned in two books today, in the sort of thriller horror, uh, category. Um, Ooh. I do a lot of fantasy, a lot of horror. Um, I run a YouTube channel that, that narrates horror stories. So other than that, it's fantasy, a little tiny bit of romance, but not much. Not enough. I should do more. All right. And I'm sure you will. <laughs> uh, so with Spencer first, I think that puts us into going alphabetically by last name, which is just like a bookstore. So it's perfect. So uh, next, everybody say hello to Jeremy Frazier. Hello, everyone. Hi, Jeremy. Um, I'm Jeremy Frazier. I will be staying where I'm at right now. I won't be moving next week. Um, <laughs> I'm in Reno, uh, Nevada. I do a lot of lit RPG and fantasy books and a little bit of male male romance. Um, love doing horror and thriller, but a lot of, lot of lit RPG. Outstanding. Well, there's Indeed, certainly going to be too. a lot of fantasy adventure coming up in the next couple of weeks. How much romance or horror may be a little up to you guys. <laughs> uh, and we're going to be we're going to be dun, talking dun, dun. more with Jeremy at the break. Uh, but for now, let's say hello to Ray Greenlee. Hello, everybody. Ray Greenlee. I am coming at you from southeastern Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia suburbs. Um, and um, my favorite uh, genre, the one I've done the most of probably that I enjoy the most is uh, science fiction. Uh, enjoy fantasy as well. Those are my favorite genres to read. Um, but recently, I've been um, having a lot of uh, uh, doing a lot of nonfiction, which has been really fascinating. Mm. It's a lot of interesting topics, things to learn. So I've been really enjoying doing that as well. Right on. Uh, and rounding out our cast, say hello to Lauren Rodriguez. Hi. I am in Austin, Texas, and um, I do a lot of young adult, new adult books. That's what I like to narrate. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and Rachel LeBlanc, who I played too. Yuza last season, is running our tech this summer. Uh, so I see people already in the chat giving lots of love to Rachel. Give Rachel all the love, because <laughs> uh, without Rachel volunteering to do that, uh, you guys would be looking at just a blank screen, wondering where we are. Um, very different look. <laughs> yes, very different look. <laughs> uh, I am Maxwell Zener, your Dungeon Master. I'm coming to you from my home studio in New York City, uh, uh, where I often narrate thrillers and mysteries and do a fair amount of uh, male-male romance and nonfiction as well. 
Uh, and none of us would be here without our producer. So let's say thanks to PANA, the Professional Audiobook Narrators Association. Uh, PANA provides support for new and established audiobook narrators while raising awareness in the public consciousness of the importance of human narrators in storytelling. Uh, to learn more about them, go check them out at pronarrators.org. Uh, and, of course, the final and most important piece of the Punch and Roll family is you all in the audience. Um, of course, no story is complete until it comes to life in the mind of the listener, uh, but you get to shape this story as well. Uh, last season, we asked you guys to throw ideas into the chat, which we incorporated when we could, and we're still doing that, so keep those suggestions coming. But this summer, uh, we want to level the audience up. So... Uh, if anything you are hearing in this adventure sparks your artistic imagination, please share it with us. We would love to see your fan art. Uh, we will happily showcase mm -hmm. anything you have. Um, uh, uh, tag us with it on Twitter or Instagram at Punch and Roll. Uh, we have those links down in the, in the doobly-doo down below as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we want to be inspired uh, by your imagination as much as we hope we are inspiring yours. Uh, and with that said, players, if you are in the chat, please step out and let us begin the summer season of Punch and Roll. Dun, dun, dun. Down in the description, by the way, I think they call it, Max. The description, yes. <laughs> is that what it is? Uh, some word that begins with D. The doodly-doo. Um, yeah, if we were... If Down we yonder. Were, uh, <laughs> if we were audiobooking, we would take a retake, but we're not. We're going live. <laughs> so we'll just forge right ahead. Uh, so our adventure uh, begins in the bustling city of Panaton on the Bay of Audia. Untold centuries ago, a major dwarven city sat here with towers that reached into the sky and deep dungeons that descended into the earth. But there was a great calamity. Uh, centuries ago, the cause now lost to the ages, but the dwarven city fell. Over time, others came to live by the glittering bay, and eventually a little modest fishing village arose, drawing sustenance forth from the waters. Uh, and indeed, those waters of Audia Bay were so inspiring that a few bards decided to settle here, and they came to found a new bardic college, based not on musical instruments, but on the magic inherent to the spoken voice itself and the stories that it can tell. And before long, the bards of Panaton were in high demand. Everyone wanted to hear them tell stories and legends from all cultures across the globe. And the Bardic College soon needed a library to store and catalog the many legends, myths, histories, fairy, fairy tales, fables that the bards needed to learn. Over the years, that library grew and grew and grew and had to add new structures, new towers, new rooms, secret rooms, until it reached the sprawling and chaotic glory that it is today. And this is where our adventure begins, uh, inside the great library of Panaton. We find four adventurers seated in a little antechamber, sitting upon ornate chairs with velvet cushions, awaiting an audience with the head librarian themselves. Players, who are we looking at? Who do we see? What do these adventurers look like? And I believe uh, one of you is unknown to the other three, so perhaps some introductions would go well. All right. Yes, so uh, one of those uh, adventures, and there is a half-elf who is uh, of a pretty moderate height, but very thin and pale looking. Um, he's got deep set dark eyes that have a haunted cast to them. Um, he uh, is wearing plain robes that cover his entire body and has a staff with him. Uh, and he introduces himself as, um, my name is Eltorin Coldheart. I came to the library to do research and now I am called for some unknown purpose. I look forward to meeting you all and perhaps seeing what might come of this recent event. El Torin, did you say? Yes. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Calden Greenwell. You know, I used to, uh, I used to traffic in books. What, uh, what are you researching here? I seek knowledge of ancient evils that have haunted this world for eons past and which have touched ancient my past. Evils. Wonderful. But, well, I, I can't say I remember 
quite every book I've read, but Ancient Evil sounds interesting. If you find something, I should like to know about it. There are many stories in the library, as you might expect. The bards seem to revel in them. The question is which ones are hold truth, and which ones are just mere tales. And, and, yes. and Spencer, what, what does Calton Greenwell look like? Paint a picture for us of, of uh, his visage. Yes, ha having taken this in, Calden leans back, and he's looking around sort of with interest, but also a bit of disdain. He's, uh, he has a, an open kind of face that, that is easy to read. It's the type that you find kind of believable, that you, the sort of person you might trust. Uh, his eyes are, are uh, roving, but not in a way that looks like he's going to steal something, but he's looking for something sort of interesting, you know, maybe a book he hasn't seen before or, or something in this college. Um, he's wearing... Uh, merchant's clothing, but he's not a merchant anymore. He's a failed merchant uh, who has <laughs> found his way into the uh, town guard, I believe. <laughs> and so, um, you know, he's a little bit down on his luck, but he's not the type to dwell on it too much. He's a, he's a human, uh, and he's rather unremarkable physically otherwise <laughs> you know no no outstanding features and uh, you know your your classic level one adventure looking sort of guy at this stage right on right on so are we getting are we getting a little bit of like a, a fish out of water vibe from him or uh not from him okay no he 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 was selling books so he's perfectly in his water here in the library. Fabulous. Uh, and, you know, um, among friends and old and new, uh, he's, he enjoys, he's a charismatic type. So he enjoys, you know, conversation, a new group and a new dynamic, this sort of thing. And uh, with books as well. Oh, and someone who's learned and is interested in them, too. That would be interesting to Calden. Right on. And uh, Jeremy Lauren, uh, tell us about uh, the other two people we have sitting here. All right, uh, Miss Gria has her eye on Calden. <laughs> she knows he's trouble, but you know, they banter well enough because she is a tiefling paladin who enjoys proving people wrong because they often just see the, this um, blue exterior with, you know, light blue skin, dark blue hair. But she's. She knows she comes off, not exactly how she is, but she likes to play that, play that card to kind of get to know her. And I am a city watch investigator. So yeah, got my eye on you, Calden. <laughs> <laughs> I have a history, uh -oh. a sordid past, <laughs> short but sordid. Indeed. As may are, come to light shortly. Are, are you in the city watch as some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of uh, forced work program? Me? Yes. Well, forced if I wanted to eat. I've, I oh, wasn't able to enough. make any money selling things, so I picked up a couple things on the road. All right. And uh, Jeremy, tell us about your character. Ulfgar is a um, dwarf, older dwarf, um, really pref not great with people all the time, really prefers to just kind of be outside under the night sky. Uh, and I think I connect well with Miss Gria, both that I used to get in trouble a lot for being out at night all the time, but I just enjoy night and I don't appreciate people just making assumptions like that. So I feel like there's a connection there. I think that's why they assigned us to the night duty, night watch. <laughs> well, yes. Indeed. And is there I can anything? see how we wound up there. Anything else you guys want to do or say while you are uh, waiting for your summons? I've fallen into a sort of comfortable silence after my brief engagement. All right. Uh, so perhaps with Miss Gria occasionally uh, sending Calden a little side eye, a few minutes pass. Uh, but before long, two half elves clad in the yellow, blue, and purple robes of the library emerge uh, and, uh, and ask you to follow them. Which I, I'm hoping you do. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I will, for, for now. <laughs> and for now, excellent. Um, they lead you into a large and sumptuous office. There's um, a couple chairs, some sofas, a very large desk. Uh, and before you, 
stands the head librarian themselves, um, a wrinkled human, uh, completely hairless, uh, age difficult to tell, but um, but 70 would be a young estimate, um, and who knows how deep into the hundreds they are, right? It's, it's, it's one of these sort of uh, uh, old but ageless faces. Hmm. Um, and they say, uh, please thank you for coming. Please settle in, settle in, make yourselves comfortable. Uh, we have refreshment if you like, and there's, there's little trays of little finger sandwiches and, and uh, 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 crystal goblets uh, with water and, and uh, with wine. Uh, and says, I appreciate your coming. Um, we have had um, a bit of a problem, uh, and we think that we need your help. Um, and I think, in particular, El Torin, uh, you uh, uh, may may want to provide that help as well. Uh, and of course, we always appreciate uh, uh, the City Watch stepping forward and helping us out. Um, now, uh, <laughs> one of the uh, secrets of the library, uh, El Torin, that I'm, I'm sure you have struggled with, is we've been notoriously bad on, uh, on our inventory control. I mean, you know how hard it is to keep track of these things. You put a book down, suddenly it's gone. Three weeks later, it appears in a different room on a different shelf. Um, it has just been the way of the library, of course. Uh, the chat, by the way, is asking if there are actual fingers in the sandwiches. Finger uh, sandwiches. Finger sandwiches sandwiches um <laughs> we've not descended to that depth of horror yet but uh, but give us time chat give us time um we um but lately the inventory has been getting worse uh over the last year or so uh things have gone missing and just just not come back uh and we're noticing uh, uh, uh several of our of our um uh, of our rooms seem uh, at this point almost empty. Um, so we did a little internal investigation to see what was going on, and we set about several of these. Uh, and he, he gestures to a side table where you see a couple of um, sort of fist-sized crystal balls sitting on the table. And he said, and last night, uh, one of these found something, uh, if you will permit me. And he sort of waves his hand, and the, the, the well, the the lanterns and candles in the room uh, don't die out. The light mm. in the room seems to dim. You can see the flames, but they don't seem to be casting much light. And then one of those crystal balls begins to glow. And in the space around you, you see uh, a flickering picture of, uh, of a bejeweled tome sitting on a pedestal. A few moments go by, and a figure descends down from above. Um, a kobold strapped into a harness from above, going zzz down sort of Mission Impossible style towards this book, <sighs> grabs it, begins oh. to be get lifted up. The weight of the book is more than this rope system was designed for, and so kobold and book and rope system clatter to the floor. Um, at which point you hear a lot of yelling. Two other kobolds come into the frame, uh, gather up the rope, and start to run. Uh, a few <laughs> moments after that, uh, a few night guards come running by in pursuit, and then the picture fades and the lights come back on. And the librarian says, the, um, the guards uh, pursued uh, these kobolds, uh, a a hoping to get that book back, uh, but they were too quick. They went down a side stairwell, and uh, the guards stopped at a section of broken open wall uh, because, well, um, you know, uh, the security guards here are very good at, you know, making sure people aren't stealing books or, or keeping open flame by the books or anything like that, but descending into the darkness after a bunch of kobolds is um, rather outside their job description. Uh, that is where we need you. We need you, if you will, to track down those kobolds, retrieve that book, it's very valuable, and see if there are any other stolen books. Uh, uh, books have been disappearing from this library for some time. Uh, if you could find and return any stolen books the kobolds might be responsible for, we would appreciate it greatly. Now, of course, we pay for services. We'll have 250 gold pieces for each of you. And um, 
we want to have a good business relationship with you so that it'll be half up front. Uh, and at that point, mm. the half-elf librarians come around and give you each a, uh, a little velvet bag heavy with coin. Uh, I am hoping you all will say yes. Um, can we count on you to, to rescue this book and help your library out? The library has been very accommodating for me in my research over this past year, and I am troubled that this seems to have started around the time that I, I started my research here. I wonder if what other forces may be at work. I will be honored to add my service to your cause. Wonderful, wonderful. No. Wait, wait, wait. As for us, let me let me talk to them for a second. Two hundred and fifty gold seems a bit light. What if we negotiate for a bounty per book we bring back? What do you think about that? Add that on top. Like two hundred and fifty per book. Oh, I like the way you think. I was thinking two hundred and fifty flat, fifty per book. But maybe we should go for broke. Is this the Bardic College? They have enough to pay us more. Calden, no need to be greedy. I'm broke. I gotta eat. Okay, fine. 250, 10 per book. But by the way, the chat is very much in favor of Calden negotiating fair pay for labor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's worth a lot to them, right? They brought us in. And a new guy. So I think we should get a little bit extra on top per book we recover. Do I have your blessing to ask for 10 gold on top? Hey, he makes a lot of sense. All right. I'll allow I it. know you can. I, do, I know you both can use some new shoes. Okay, excuse me. Yes. We've discussed it a little bit, and we would like a, a bounty per book. Now, so what's you're asking, each book worth for you? So, uh, so you don't want the flat payment. You would like a, a share in whatever oh, you no. recover. We need the flat payment uh, to get uh, things that we'll need for the journey. So, consider that in advance. Consider that partial payment on the table, and, um, so you said you're missing a lot of books? Well, yes. I hate to be so blunt, but we're, we're foot soldiers here. How much is each book worth to you? Ah, uh, I see what you're getting at. Go ahead and make a persuasion roll. Oh, I need to practice this stuff. Okay, persuasion <laughs> roll. It is, uh, I'm proficient in that, so I think I just click it. Yeah, just click on that persuasion roll button. <laughs> oh, It's a 10. No. Okay, let me uh, let me botch this a little bit. Um, yeah. Calden comes across a little bit too eager. Uh, maybe he's, uh, uh, so, so, so what's it worth to you? Maybe, maybe 10, 5? Ah, I see. The, um, the payment of 250 gold uh, is essentially an estimate of the value of books we, we would expect you to return. Uh, I, I suppose if you bring back any books that are particularly especially valuable, we could pay you a little extra on top. But as we don't know exactly what you'll be able to bring back, it is difficult to negotiate a payment above what we already have offered you. <laughs> Calden sits back, crosses his arms, and looks over. Hmm. You got me. <laughs> El Torn will take one of the, I guess, one of the gold coins from the um, bag that he got, and he flips it over to Calden. Here, buy yourself a beer to drown your sorrows. Oh, this job's looking better already. <laughs> I'll take it. Thanks. Right. Give you a big thumbs up, like, hey, nice job doing that. Nice. <laughs> we're we're 20 minutes in, and the cast is already s talking smack to each other. <laughs> 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 all right. Hey, you uh, miss all the shots you don't take, and look, I got a. <laughs> uh, no, I, I should tell you, uh, El Torin, uh, in, in, in particular, I think the book uh, that's gone missing may interest you in particular. Uh, that book, that, that jewel becrusted heavy book, uh, is the legends of the Earth's Lord Dread. Uh, the, now, you have all heard, of course, of the Earth's Lord Dread. The Earth's Lord Dread um, 
was uh, is an ancient desert that's been um, devoid of water and green life uh, for time immemorial. Uh, centuries ago, uh, a mighty blue dragon by the name of Istangul uh, used the uh, the Urzlor Dread uh, as his home. Uh, and rained terror and cruelty uh, 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 for hundreds of miles in every direction. Uh, eventually, that dragon was defeated by a great dwarven mage, uh, but still, um, the, the desert itself is viewed as uh, a land of evil and a land of danger, a land where mm. um, monsters and evil spirits are said to accumulate. Um, so the the book uh, describing the legends of the Earth's Lord Dread uh, may be of particular interest to Eltorin. Yes, I have been hoping to view that tome, but it always seemed uh, unavailable until now. Perhaps this is a, a beneficial opportunity for me to finally get to view it. Yes, indeed. That that was our thinking, and and why we thought you you, you might want to accompany the City Watch, uh, as they help out. Uh, well, if there are no no further questions, uh, let us uh, let us guide you to the site of the break in. Yes, All right, please. let's go. Uh, and with that, uh, the half-elven librarians guide you down a staircase, uh, which leads you to a hall, which leads you to another staircase, uh, going down, which leads up and they take you through a storeroom uh, with lots of books and then a storeroom with not that many books uh, and then they lead you past the room in which the crime happened uh, you can see the knocked over pedestal on which this book sat you see in the ceiling still a little um, little screwed in pulley uh, that the kobolds somehow managed to attach to the top of the ceiling uh, to lower one of their number to the pedestal below uh, you see some stone chips on the floor from where the pedestal knocked over uh, there's a open door uh, still sort of swinging open uh, which is the staircase that the kobolds descended uh, they lead you uh, down that staircase to a busted open section of wall um, and uh, inside there is nothing but and they gesture mm -hmm. and they say this is where the kobolds disappeared and um this is, uh, well, where you should go. How big is the hole? Uh, the hole itself is not that big. Uh, probably comfortable for a kobold, but not super comfortable for anybody bigger than a kobold. So it would be a bit of a squeeze for you to fit through. But, mm. but, you, but you can squeeze through. Right, it's, you know, it's maybe four feet high and, and uh, two feet wide, something like that. Well, before we go in here, gang, I feel like I should mention this this group seems particularly crafty. I mean, you saw the pulley thing. We're going to need to be careful when we go through here. That is not one of any... my specialties. Make as long as you have the right but... tools. <laughs> All right, you brought snacks, right? Because this looks like it's going to take a while. All right, who's going in first? I will go. All right. Does anybody... Ahead a little. Who, who in this crew has and who doesn't have dark vision? Dark vision. Dark vision. I, I feel like I saw that, but I... Oh, yeah. Dark yeah, vision, 60 we, feet. Didn't we check that? Where I would find that under my... I, you're a human, right? I am. Yeah, no dark vision for you. No dark vision. Uh, so uh, the lot of you I'm other than like... other than Calden uh, see... Um, a staircase that descends down from this uh, broken through section. Um, if if anybody wants to make me either an investigation or a uh, intelligence stonecraft check, uh, you could. Oh, I'll do that. All right. I'm yeah. Good stonecraft. yeah, stonecrafting for the dwarf yeah. makes a lot of sense. Thirteen for an investigation check on Miscria. Okay. We got twelve for Altorin. Right on. What about that stonecrafting check? Um. I think that just gives me advantage. Roll it. Cool. Well, that's 18's pretty mm -hmm. good. All right. Yeah, you certainly don't yeah, need better than 18. an 18. Um, <laughs> so uh, 
so Ulfgar, as you're sort of looking at, as you're sort of squeezing into this mm. uh, stonework space, um, you're noticing that the the section of stone that you're slipping through seems newer than the rest, and and you could deduce from that that um, this the the staircase you're heading down into probably is an older part of the library that was sealed off before. So the kobolds may have broken through the wall, but did not build this flight of stairs. I'll uh, inform everyone as if I'm a tour guide. I was going to say, Ooh, pointing God, out little what, scratches, and you can see, right, you can see here that, that it's just done with older style tools. <laughs> oh, okay. Like, it's super Good exciting. Eye. But is it safe? Oh, it's quite safe. Okay. I can't see anything. Maybe I should, like, light a torch. Do you think it's I'll, okay uh, to get some light in there? I'll hand you a gold coin and say, Mistra will guide you, and that gold coin will light up. Wow. I'd like to hold it, hold it up and maybe hold it out. Is it like a light everywhere? Is it like a flashlight type of thing? It'll give you... It, it light, it's lighting everywhere, so it's All glowing. Right. It gives you 20-foot... Uh, radius of bright and additional 20 foot of dim. Ooh, this is brilliant. Thank you. Which, which is just enough dim light to see down to the bottom of these stairs that descend about 40 feet. Um, uh, and, and as you head down, you, you notice that the stairs under your feet and the walls next to you uh, are getting progressively slicker. Uh, as the air down here uh, gets progressively more and more damp. Mm -hmm. And finally you come down into what looks to be a small storage basement. Um, it is dusty, it is dank, it is clearly moldy. Uh, there's a number of, of wooden bookcases that are, are in an advanced stage of, of rot uh, with some mold growing on. Uh, you see some piles of papers, uh, little wooden carts full of, of uh, scrolls and some book tomes, uh, and you don't see an obvious way out the so what hmm. would you guys like to do? Well, first, I'd like to say that Galden's missing out on some extra cash if these books are moldy and worth anything. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's almost, we could take him with us, but it's so close to the door, it's a miracle nobody's come down here already. Okay, Oops. should we... But you know, this thing seems messed up. Should we, should we try moving it? They have to yeah. have escaped through here somehow, right? Yeah, start moving bookshelves or books. Bookshelves. Well, well, maybe. Cobalt are think? a bit smaller. I don't know that they'd be moving shelves around after themselves. I yeah, mean, if you work as point. a team, anything's possible. Look at the pyramids. And they did build this sort of rope contraption. Maybe we can knock on it and see if there's a, a sound that's a deeper sound. Maybe let's try before we move anything. So Calden would like to go and maybe kind of hit the back of the shelf and see if I can hear a hollow sound. Sure, well, there's a couple spot. shelves spread around. You, you move around knocking. Um, and and as you do, uh, um, the the energy of your hand wrapping on these, uh, these decaying bookcases, as you do pff, sort of these puffs of, of moldy dust uh, begin oh. to fly up into the air. Oh. And I'd like everybody, please, to make a constitution saving throw. Against poison? Nice. Uh, yes, it would be against poison. Calden is waving. <laughs> it's getting back Mr. quickly. Got a 20. Doing one of these. 20, that's definitely good. <laughs> I, uh, Calden got a 19. <laughs> that's, that passes. All right. And a 20 for Eltorin. All right. Uh, Ulfgar's got a 19. All right, like, so so phew. none of you, uh, I mean, you're all sort of <laughs> with uh, the now moldy dust in the air, uh, but none of you suffer any serious, um, any serious uh, 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 debilitations from it. Uh, as you're searching around, uh, you find um, on one of the shelves, there's a small wooden crate that has uh, a bunch of slips of paper on them. Uh, each has uh, the name of a book or scroll, the name of a person, and a date written next to it. Um, uh, uh, 
a perker of who had taken books and what time they needed to come back and that sort of thing. Um, people who have hair colored like mine might recognize these as library cards. Uh, the rest <laughs> of you might be like, what are you talking about? Um, uh, you, most of the books you find are far too damaged to tell what they once were, but there is one of the bookshelves uh, is marked adult romance and does have a few salvageable books on them, um, which you could explore. Uh, and one of the other bookcases does give you a bit of a boom, hollow sort of sound as you knock on it. Hmm. Shall we try to move it? I say we shall. Yeah, I was like, he's, uh, Calvin's going, <laughs> I found one. I found one that sounds hollow. Also, sorry. Do you guys want to move it or do you want to look around in the room a little bit more? I did see a couple of salvageable books up there, but maybe we can leave them for later. I mean, we got to come back through here somehow. So. Yeah, in theory, that's true. And there's no sense carrying them down there. They'll just get more messed up. Very true. Okay, does anybody want to give me a hand on the other side of this book bookshelf? Bookcase? Sure. I'm All right, El Torin, did, okay, was that who? No. Was that Ulf? Ulfgar will help you. All right, let's do it. Lift on three. Do you want us each to roll strength? I was waiting for Max to tell me what to oh, roll. Oh, yeah, right on. <laughs> uh, no, it is, uh, this is, uh, um, this bookcase is is certainly light enough that that a, a, mm. a couple of adventurers working together uh, can move it pretty easily. That's One, the good news. Two, three. Another piece of good news is that you guys had definitely the right idea up at the top of the stairwell to wonder whether there were any traps. The bad news is you didn't wonder it about it right now. No. Uh, so what happens is you pick up that bookcase and you move it. Uh, and too late, you notice um, a cord attached to the back of that bookcase that only had to get moved a little bit uh, to go taut and break. And once broken, you hear this noise and then this clatter of that sounds like like somebody upending uh, an entire uh, an entire kitchen shelf full of pots and pans off in the distance. Uh, this elaborate noise, uh, uh, very clearly announcing your presence to whoever might want to hear it. Uh, but with that bookcase moved, you see uh, chiseled out of the wall this small sort of slimy tunnel uh, heading through the rock. How oh, small? Um, small enough that a kobold would move very easily through it, but small enough that you guys, it will be, it will be a squeeze. Again, you can fit there. Is this like a crawl or like we're, we're worming or? Probably the, the kobolds would have crawled. You guys are going to have to army crawl it. Uh, and for, uh, for the broader shouldered of you, it, it may be a bit of a squeeze. Um, but it is it is doable, but it will it may feel a little claustrophobic. I'll explain to everybody that this doesn't seem to be part of the original library. This was probably added by the kobolds mm. based on the stonework. Mm. <laughs> yes, the stonework <laughs> is the only clue. <laughs> All right, um. <laughs> and they they already know we're crawling. I was gonna say, Uthgar, are you okay? Did you get did you get hit with anything? Are you hurt after that trap? No, no, I'm fine. Uh, I think Should it might have checked. been an alarm, though. Yeah, so, they're gonna know we're here now. My bad. El Torin will um, will go to the the opening, and he will um, use his. Uh, he'll cast uh, do uh, some motions with his hands, and a, a gust of wind shoots down the tunnel, and he'll shout after it. Doom comes to you all. Flee for your lives. And he's gonna try to um. <laughs> And uh, some like showers and sparks will shoot down the tunnel as, as well. Whoa. And he's gonna try this to. This guy's um, intense. Gonna try to uh, to hopefully uh, scare whoever's at the other end of that tunnel a little bit, so maybe they're a little less prepared. Yeah, love it. So you see, especially with the sparks lighting the way, you see it down about um, about uh, uh, fifteen feet through uh, a thick, probably foundational wall. Um, before the, the air puff poof, 
releases on the other side of wherever it is. Uh, and with those sparks, you can see a l just for a moment that it opens up into uh, a, a wider place. Um, as the sound of that gust dies down, you can hear a trickling of water. Uh, which is probably the source of the moisture that is collected in this room over the gears. Um, and there doesn't seem to be an immediate response to your shout. Ulfgar will go running at the hole and just dive into it and with impressive speed, squirm his way into it, growling <laughs> Wait, as he oh, goes. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you, with, with that running start, give me an athletics check. All right. Roll it. Ooh, that's oh. a three. <laughs> yeah, so unfortunately... You didn't want to wait um, to make sure there were no other booby traps before you did that? We have yeah, a clog. The, the broad-shouldered nature of the dwarf, um, <laughs> you, you get about two feet in and then just, just squeak right to a stop. Little legs kicking behind. <laughs> I'll get you, I'll get you. <laughs> I guess we'd like to pull... Pull him out carefully. Yeah, all right. So you, or you push him through. <laughs> or push him through. Should we, I, I assume oh, he's should already there. Might as well just push. Push or pull, buddy. Why lose the Hot progress you've forward. already made? Let's go. Push. <laughs> okay. Push. <laughs> so, um, uh, Miscrea, uh, give us uh, give us another athletics check as you are pushing him forward. Athletics check. That is a 14. All right, not bad. Uh, so with that, and hey, you know what? Since uh, since Ufgar is giving you the army crawl assist, go ahead and roll with advantage. So just go with, give another roll. We'll okay. see what the higher number is. Okay, oh, so okay. just right. one more roll. Come on. Ooh, 11. All right, so we'll go with the 14. Uh, so um, uh, with your strength pushing from behind uh, and Ulfgar working, uh, you're able to squeeze through. Uh, Ulfgar, you're definitely feeling uh, that abrasion along your shoulders. <laughs> uh, your, your armor may come out a little, little scratched and a little worse for wear. Uh, but after uh, a couple minutes of pushing, um, uh, Ulfgar, you sort of pop out uh, and drop down onto a little ledge where you are surrounded by bent cooking pots and skillets and a few um, a few metal bowls and even a couple of empty lanterns. Uh, the, clearly the source of the sound of this clattering down. Um, and this little ledge sits over what is clearly part of the city sewers uh, that mm. in this part are running north to south. To the north, there is a heavy iron grate uh, that would prevent anyone from moving through the sewer to the north. Mm. But the sewer is open and extends to the south. All right, I'll call back. Right, come on through. And I'm How gonna was the out. landing? It didn't sound like it was soft. Ah, it's fine. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right, here goes. Calden would like to proceed at a normal pace through carefully. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, it is a little tight, but after a couple minutes, you're able to get through. And uh, <clears throat> is Calden coming through as well? Yes. Oh, sorry. Is uh, El Torin coming yep, through El as well? El Torin will follow. Yep. All right. Uh, Miss Gria's so, got the beer. Yeah. So before. So is it, you said is, bef it, is it? Uh, is assuming that uh, there's some dirt and grime from the tunnel as he came through? Uh, yeah, and, and the chat has correctly predicted the color of the water flowing through the sewer. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is not the best of smell and is not the best of colors. Well, after um, El Torin comes out, he's going to just start waving his hand over his clothes and they're going to be cleaning. He's going to be cleaning his, uh, his that robes. That's a neat trick. I was going to make a joke about boiling sewage water to drink, but after seeing that... I don't think it's going to go over well. This yeah. is a clean and, and tidy fellow. And after after moving through the slimy tunnel, all of you are uh, are perhaps in need of a bit of a cleaning. Um, uh, but the the sewer stretches out uh, before you to the south, and there is that grate to the north. What would you guys like to do? I want to check the grate. Or can sure. we uh, check for check for tracks? I don't know if anybody is particularly good mm -hmm. at that. See if we can tell which way the kobolds might have gone. Yeah, uh, let's have, uh, uh, from you, El Torin, let's have a um, survival check. And Ulfgar, checking out that great, give me an investigation. <sighs> Two. 
two. Oh. <laughs> two on investigation. What was that two survival on check? investigation and a seven and on the survival seven. check. Um, it is it is un unsurprisingly <laughs> footprints are difficult to find in the middle of a sewer. Um, it it does tell you perhaps that uh, whoever was traveling here was traveling you know through the water rather than trying to clamber along the sides somehow. Um, the uh, uh, the grate itself, um, you're not able to glean much information from it, Ulfgar, but the, uh, there is a padlock on that grate that is very large, very old, and rusted out, uh, from, from periodically getting swamped by, uh, by flood water in a rainstorm. Mm. Um, so it doesn't look as if that grate has been opened, or maybe even open a bowl, for quite some time. Mm. Right. Uh, well, perhaps seems like is, they're going through here. That is not the way. Shall we try <laughs> the other direction? So you guys thinking we should go south? Aye. Sounds like south's the way to it, go. Along the uh, much more obvious, sort of clear <laughs> opening that we could go into. All right, I will. I'll lead the way with my handy coin. All right, so you splash into this uh, into this uh, unpleasant uh, muck before you, and begin mm. to head south. It's about ten feet wide. Uh, this tunnel, uh, so you can either go in straight file, you can go uh, uh, two abreast. Uh, how, what is your marching order? How would you guys like to move through this sewer? Well, I put myself in the pole position in first. Okay, not necessarily. Just out of I'll, uh, uh, the event. El Torn is, is comfortable shadowing, shadowing behind a little bit. Yeah. Ulfgar will, I'll, I'll go shoulder to shoulder with the Calvin. Okay. I'll go, if um, El Torn's holding back, I'll go right in the middle. All right, so we've got uh, Calvin and Ulfgar up front, Miskri in the middle, and then El Torn behind. Um, uh, with the light from this coin shining forward, uh, illuminating your way 40 feet at a time. Uh, you walk through this sewer for a while. You make it about 50 yards down until you come to a T-junction with a side tunnel heading off to your left. Okay, the first thing I want to do before we even walk through to the T-junction is see if I can check or a sort of trap or machination that's 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 in here. Uh, uh, we should sure. be an investigation. investigation. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. I'm going to click that. My investigation check was a 22. All right. So, um, keeping your eyes, knowing uh, now that the kobolds like to uh, set surprises, uh, you've been keeping your eyes open, but haven't come across anything. You haven't come across any trip wires or any other obvious traps. All right, this one looks safe. You guys can come on through. All right, follow along. All right. So there's a, a mm -hmm. side tunnel that goes off to the left, and then but it, uh, the also continues forward. Yes, and I'd like everybody please to make a perception check. Perception. Oof. There go. Calden's perception eight. is five. Uh oh. Eight. Too busy focusing on looking for those traps. Yep. <laughs> Miss Grio is 15. Okay. So um, uh, the good news is I don't have to do any math to figure out what your group average is because not a single one of you uh, was high enough to uh, <laughs> to accomplish what you needed to accomplish. Uh, uh, that's the good news. The bad news is uh, everyone, please roll initiative. And you, you may have to jog my. Uh... <laughs> Miss Gray rolled a fifth. Miss Gray oh, rolled there a it fifteen. Is. Yeah, Oscar's got an eleven. <laughs> Footed with a five for okay. his initiative roll. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I got no bonus. But to that? there's no traps. No. Nope. My initiative says plus zero. No yeah. traps, per se. But there is definitely an encounter. So, um, as you. Uh, as you are sitting here at this uh, uh, at this intersection, wondering uh, where exactly to go, um, uh, heading towards I'm going to say Miscria because you're in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, this is oh, does a 21 hit your armor class? 
It does. <laughs> it does. So out of the darkness from that side tunnel, there is a whizz of a, of a pebble coming. Uh, you take any points of bludgeoning damage as wow. it pings off of your helmet. And we are um, off. And you you look into uh, uh, the next in the initiative order is Miscria, but as you are surprised, you cannot take an action yet. Mm. Um, uh, next up in the initiative order is Ulfgar. Same thing, you're surprised, you can't take an action, but you now have whipped around uh, the two of you looking down this tunnel, and you can see just above the water uh, in this tunnel, you can see sort of tiny little lizard-like draconic heads sticking up out of the water, uh, the kobolds having nearly immersed themselves in this liquid to attempt to surprise you. Floating on the water, is a little wicker basket. Uh, Altor, and it's now your count in the initiative order. Um, as surprise, you can't do anything. Um, same with Calden. And now we get to the last kobold who reaches up and for their action, opens the wicker basket. And you guys can see some movement inside as whatever is in this wicker basket is about to be released. Um, <laughs> the chat has said that you failed, but you failed as a team. So, <laughs> <laughs> at least you're still together. Um, uh, brings us around now to back to the top of the order. So that first kobold uh, now sends a second sling bullet, uh, uh, sending it to um, who was in the back. That Eltorin. was Eltorin, sending the next sling bullet to you, Eltorin. That is a 13 against your armor class. That is not going to do it. All right. So that sling bullet nice. goes past your ear, and that brings us to Miscria. These kobolds uh, and whatever's in this basket is about 30 feet away from you through what is waist-deep water. Uh, so nice. moving through this water is going to be difficult terrain. So basically yeah. consider mm. your speed halved as you try to push your way through this water. Oh, geez. Okay. Um... So I guess I can only go 15 feet. To take action to go the full 30 feet, but that would be your action to do it. Right. Or you could take a defend action to uh, make it harder for them to hurt you. That's true. You could move 15 feet closer and then just dodge any attacks coming your way. Yeah, that sounds exactly Are we allowed what Miss should do. How much talk? There's something in that basket. Be careful. I don't know what's in that basket. But yeah. I'd like to know. I have I have a plan for the basket. Oh, I, think I, 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 think I, like... I think that's about enough chatter as you can do outside <laughs> of your of your turn and initiative. All right, so Miss Grid uh -huh. is moving 15 feet forward, uh, and then holding on guard. At that Get point, my shield up. Yeah, at that point, the first thing in the basket is revealed, as um, a brightly colored snake begins to swim out, Mother sliding on the surface of the water, uh, coming right for you. Uh, coming right for you, Miss Kriya. I'm going to mm -hmm. give you half cover for being in such deep water. Uh, so this is going to be a uh, regular roll, but with half covered, that drops from a 16 to a 14. Does a 14 hit your armor class? That does not. All right. So you're, oh, but it should have been a disadvantage, right? Because you're dodging, but it didn't hit you anyway. Uh, yeah. So it, uh, the snake bounces off uh, of your shield. The chat is pointing mm. out that this is like a terrible episode of Chopped uh, with live <laughs> snakes pouring out of the basket, uh, and <laughs> which indeed it is. Uh, that brings us now to Ulfgar. Uh, Ulfgar is going to move forward to get at least in front of um, El Torin. Okay. So you're moving uh, forward, blocking uh, their view to El Torin. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm going to point at the, the snake that's coming out, mm -hmm. and I'm going to cast Sacred Flame. I need you to give me a deck save. Right on. Uh, deck save for the snake is... A four. <laughs> That's a net one. Wah, wah, That's wah. Fail. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Uh, take one. <laughs> take one wah, radiant wah, damage. Wah. Oh, damage. <laughs> All right. That actually is quite a lot for the poisonous snake. Uh, it burns and hisses and twists uh, as the light of your god descends down into this dark place and singes this snake, but unfortunately not enough to kill it. Um, was there anything else you wanted to do on your turn? Nope. That's oh. what I got. 
All right. Uh, now the second poisonous snake comes out of this basket, again, making a beeline for Miscrea. This time I will remember to roll the attack with disadvantage. <laughs> At least I'll try. Oh, it didn't roll with disadvantage this time, so I'll just roll again. Uh, <laughs> At least it might be. That, it makes me feel a little bit yeah. better when when you have uh, some sort of hang up. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I got it the first time, but I failed this time. Uh, that's a twelve. So twelve does that, not hit. Yeah. So the snakes swarming around you uh, in the dark water, but not able to get to you, and that brings us to El Torin. All right. So there's a kobold back there that hasn't acted yet this round. Yes. And they are, how far away are they? About 30 feet from your location. The kobold is just 30 feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, El Torin will um, uh, hold his staff in one hand and make a swirling motion with his other hand and reach and close his fist toward that kobold and cast Frostbite. So that kobold uh, will need to make a constitution saving throw. Okay. Constitution saving throw for this kobold is... Glad he's on our side. <laughs> Twelve. Twelve will not do it. So uh, how much damage does this spell do? So it will... He'll take five damage. Okay. And um, the cold settles over him and, and uh, makes his hands numb and his arms harder to use and he will have disadvantage on his next uh, weapon attack roll. He will not have disadvantage on his next weapon attack roll because the because. cold uh, freezing this water actually <laughs> the water just forms an ice cube around oh. this kobold uh, who's, who's dying breath <gasps> You stuck as an style. air bubble in the uh, in the ice cube, and the ice cube just bobs up and begins to slowly <laughs> drift away <laughs> as, that, as that kobold has been killed. Sad kobold. Uh, anything else you want to do on your turn? Uh, nope. All right. That'll do it. The next thing that comes out of the basket uh, is... There's more. Uh, uh, there's more. A centipede, but a centipede about the length of your arm. A uh, very big centipede mm -hmm. that nope. skitters up along the wall and climbs up to the ceiling and begins over the ceiling, passes over Miscrea's head, uh, <sighs> heading to the lot of you. Uh, is now above the heads of uh, the group in the back. So that's above the heads of, uh, I think that is uh, Calden and El Torin, mm -hmm. um, but is not dropping down yet. Uh, and that brings us to Calden. I got it. I'm going to take out the bow that I have, if and I can remember how to find it. Um, I've got a short bow, and mm. it's okay. So I want to take aim at the centipede. Sure. See if I can hit that thing from here. Yeah, it's right so, above your head, so it shouldn't be. Let's hope it's so. Hitable. Well, the the to hit is thirteen. That is what you need it. So go ahead and roll oh, your damage against man. the giant centipede. And the giant centipede will take oh six points of damage. Nice. So he, you know, pulls it back and in a pretty quick, quick and dirty shot uh, hits it. Maybe right in the center of it. I don't know if it's dead or not. I'm it hoping absolutely it's is. Very you dead. skewer it right through the center. Uh, and, pin it um, to the ceiling. Indeed, yeah. The, the arrow pins to the ceiling, and the centipede twitches and slides down that arrow a little bit, but not all the way. So there's just that giant centipede just hanging like a, a really macabre chandelier <laughs> above your head. <laughs> But those no. are the finger sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Yummy. We are according can to the chat. We make a lot of sandwiches out of those legs. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We're now now we're, you guys have bought full in to the idea that this is an episode of Chopped. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, survival so I need to know. Survival style. How, how, um, how wide is the tunnel that Miscre is going down? Uh, also about 10 feet. Okay. Um, Okay, so for my next move, I want to move behind Miss Kriya. Maybe put a hand on her back and say, I'm behind you, or behind you. You know, I'm sort of, I may be a little bit bigger than, than her, I think, but I want to sort of be... Sort of screened by Nearby, her. but also like a, a sort of supporting role. Right on. All right. Uh, next up in the initiative order is the Kobold Sickle. Uh, they're dead. They don't get a turn. So that brings us round to the top uh, with the one remaining kobold uh, who um, 
who pulls out a dagger uh, and Komodo lizard-like is quickly mm. swimming through the water uh, mm -hmm. to come up to Miss Korea. Uh, and because they have allies around you, they're able to use their pack tactics to get advantage on this attack against you, Miss Korea. Uh, so that mm -hmm. cancels out the dodge that you're doing. So this is going to be just oh, a man. straight roll. Does straight eight, roll. And I think an 18 <gasps> is going to hit you, right? Yes, many, it's going to hit. How many kobolds okay. are there? One <clears throat> left. Does it still have allies? Does that, does that still the count? Snakes. There's the two snakes. The snakes the count snakes. as snakes part of the pack? Count. Okay. Yep. Uh, and you take four points of piercing damage as that dagger slips under your armor uh, mm -hmm. and okay. finds your torso. Ouch. And, uh, and there's the kobold... nothing I can do... Not at the yet. moment. Not okay. yet. Perhaps on your turn, but not Got yet. Got like a reaction, but that's opportunity attack is not applicable here. Okay, no, it's so. not. Uh, uh, you are up. You've got the kobold in front of you and snakes on either side. Shoot. <laughs> what a pickle. <laughs> that is. <laughs> at least I'm, I got your back. You got my back. Okay. Um, hmm. You see... I am debating about striking one and healing myself, but... Heal would not be a bad plan. I know, but I want to take one out for what they just did to me. All right, well, we're in combat, so you got to make a choice quickly. I know, okay, fine. I'm <laughs> going to take we're gonna my be five <laughs> lay, hand, lay on hands pool and do five healing. Oh, All right. Yeah. Yeah. That what does that look nice. like when when uh, when your your pool of healing takes effect? Um, a light glow comes. I kind of hover my hands over where that stab wound was, and a light glow kind of encompasses my body and then fades. Nice, and you can see the the trickle of blood that was pouring out of her armor from that stab wound uh, disappears as the wound is magically healed. Um, anything oh, else? I love you that do? spell. Save me more than once. Um, I'm just uh, reinforce like my, me just sitting behind my shield. I'm like, All right, but I'll I get you I'm next turn. turn. But I think the lay on hands was your action, right? So yeah. you're not. Yeah, okay. I'm just like. So the Towering poisonous snake that was mountains. burned now gets to go. Uh, it um, uh, perhaps a little bit of uh, of uh, Pavlovian conditioning uh, attacked the paladin, got burned, and so is now turning its attention <laughs> to the to the other uh, target next to it. So this bite is coming against our rogue, and that is going to be a seven against your armor class. Oh, he just just misses. <laughs> this is all right. So, Ulfgar, you are up next. Ulfgar is going to move forward. Uh, I don't like this attack. This snake attacking everybody. Okay. So, Ulfgar moves forward, pulls out a warhammer, and <laughs> tries to hit the snake. All right. And are you Splashes going for? Are you going for the snake that was injured before, or the other snake? Yeah. Yeah, the one that was that uh, got singed and is attacking. All right. Go uh, for it. I'll do a twenty-one. Oh, that hits. All right, come on, better damn. That's gonna be two, <laughs> two damage. I was totally ready for that to be <laughs> Splatter City. But that is that is all that you needed. So you, with the hammer and and uh, Miscreus shielding held forth, you uh, you pin that snake between your hammer and the shield, and there was a resounding uh, sort of a gong and a splat at the same time uh, <laughs> as uh, as this snake is destroyed. The Thor Captain America situation. Did we say it was a two, by the way? I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I heard that. It's a two that damage. That was two points was of enough. damage. It was enough, yeah. Anything else, Ulfgar? Uh, no, I'll just get ready for the next enemy. All right. The next enemy is another poisonous snake, which Ulfgar is turning its attention to you. Uh, does an 18 hit your armor class? Uh, yes, it does. Okay. So you take one piercing damage. And you have to make a constitution saving throw. Now, this is against poison, and it's a dwarf. I think you get to make that at advantage? I believe so. All right. With advantage. Uh, 14. That is enough. Uh, so instead of taking six poison damage uh, from the snake's venom, you take three. I don't think I realized All they right. could do that. 
<laughs> Poisonous <laughs> snakes to... have poison. Well, yeah, but I mean, Generally that's a stay lot. Away from that's a lot of damage. <laughs> it poison is. damage, you know. All right, El Torin, you are up. All right, um, El Torin will, uh, after the uh, the uh, standing under the hanging um, speed, which is no longer an issue, turns his attention to the other kobold. Once again, raises a hand into the air, will turn, holds, and towards him, and there's a crunch, and once again, Frost starts to concentrate on the kobold, and he needs to make a constitution saving throw. All right, this constitution saving throw is a four. Oof. That will not do it. So he will take three da- frost damage. All right, three frost damage, not enough to kill a kobold, but... Um, but lines of frost are etched across his face and his arms, and he gives a little <coughs> sort of uh, squeal of pain. Um, and uh, once again, he's, uh, his joints are frozen up, and he will have disadvantage on his next weapon attack. Nice. Uh, anything else? Uh, we'll advance towards the rear of the group a little bit, but still leaving, uh, you know, maybe 10 feet between him and the, uh, the snakes. Sounds good. Uh... Next up in the initiative is the giant centipede. That's dead. So, Calden, you're up. Okay. I think I'm going to go ahead and take a crack at this snake since it's broken our line. Um, okay. And it's close. It's closest to me. Indeed. I think. Um, so let's let's just go right for it. So to hit would be a 13. That hits. And the damage on that is a one. Is- you was going to say, this is like your short sword? This is, yeah, one of the daggers, yep. Yeah, uh, well, you definitely can you get your sneak attack since it is right next to an ally of yours. I, I, I realize I should have mentioned I have my bow up. Do I need to take an action to stow it? Uh, you can be holding uh, your bow in one hand and your dagger in the other. Okay. Does that still mean I can stab it twice? <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, okay. it does not. Um, um, I, but you do get your sneak attack on this first dagger stab. Okay, so let's roll that, which is a brilliant six. Ooh. Ah, so seven points of damage altogether, which is more than enough that you need to take up this snake. So uh, he just sort of dips down a uh, uh, dagger under the water, plunging it back up with the snake head skewered perfectly Shuck. on the tip of that dagger. Ugh. That's and, done and uh, dusted. Yeah. The only the only enemy left is this uh, frostbitten kobold. Uh, is there anything else you want to do on your turn, Calden? No, I'm going to stay sort of sheltered, but also supporting, you know, the the back. Okay. Uh, it is save that the... head to be barbecued. <laughs> yeah, it is. Save the, the kobold <laughs> for questioning. It is the kobold's turn. Does uh, do any of you happen to speak the draconic? Uh, yes. Then you hear the the kobold. Um, uh, shout out, um, I will defend the Great One with my life! Uh, as it jumps forward with a dagger uh, to, uh, well, it's right in front of Miskri and hit before, so it's going to do that again. No longer gets the pack tactics. Uh, still rolls a 22 to hit you, Miskri. Uh, dis- oh, disadvantage, nice. though, because it's cold. Oh, disadvantage, that's right, thank you. And the disadvantage turns the 22 into a 5. <laughs> so it's cold. It does not the hit. dagger up in Miskri, you see that it picked the perfect opportunity, coming above your shield, coming to your eye, and then its arm just <laughs> locks, and it's sort of staring at its arm like, why won't you move? Um... Uh, Numb fingers and, fum, fumble the uh, fumble the dagger. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and its turn is wasted. So, and Miscrea, you are up. All Speaking right. of wasted, get this. Getting thing. my scimitar and going to to take a whack at it with a roll of fourteen. Fourteen hits. All right, so he will take two damage, four damage, four damage. Four damage. So how do you finish this kobold off? Take my scimitar right above my head, and I slice through. Yeah, so just a downward slice of the scimitar just halfway into that kobold's head, (laughs) uh, and it it splits apart. Would have gone further, but the kobold's head is kind of frozen from the spell before, uh, and uh, the kobold's body drifts away, and you all are out of initiative. (gasps) Is everybody okay? Are you guys okay? Is anybody hurt? I might need 
to get my wound treated for infection after sitting in this sewage, but I'll figure that out later. And I will tell you where you are standing. The kobolds seem to be perching guard beside a door in the side of the sewer wall. And uh, about 30 feet down at the very edge of that uh, dim light coming from that glowing coin, you can see another door. Head to well, the door. Do you? Should we check it out? Go to the do one they came from? Do we need to check for any more traps? I, I mean, we should check, check for more traps. Check, on, check for traps <laughs> yeah. on the doors, for sure. <laughs> There's right. no should we. Right. We, we should. Uh, go ahead, anyone who'd like to take a uh, take an investigation roll on uh, checking for traps there. Investigation. Oh, that's three. I've, are we allowed to... I think you, you mentioned some rule yeah. around too yeah, many my, checks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my guide, my sort of general rule on this is uh, two people can make a check, or if it's something where one can help another, perhaps one person could make that check with advantage. But certainly two of you can check this door for traps. Okay. Well, well we think we got to we... leave that to our rogue from now on. <laughs> <laughs> We've done that, and I'm I'm comfortable with rolling the dice and, yeah, and go going with our actions as they are, rather than uh, retconning that. So, yeah, go for it. But if there's more traps, then there's more traps, and okay. we'll sort that out when we get there. All right. So neither El Torin nor Miss Gria found any traps on this door. Okay. Well, I'll I'll go first. All so right. Calden would like to walk through the chamber or into this larger chamber. Well, you swing that door open, and it's not a very large chamber, it turns out. Uh, it looks like this was probably like a storage area or break room for whoever built this sewer back in the day. Uh, there's an old small table, a couple chairs, a cage for tools that, that sits empty and dusty. There is some bedding uh, in the corner that looks more recently used. Perhaps this is where those kobolds were bedded down. Um, but there is no way out of this, uh, there's no way out of this, uh, of this room. Uh, and it is clearly where these kobolds would use to rest, uh, which uh, might be an excellent place for you to do as well. I was going to say, actually, uh, we're, we're 11 past. Maybe we should pause in the room and uh, do our, uh, our, our mid-sesh uh, breaks. You, you read my mind. You read my mind. Uh, so why don't we, why don't we uh, take a break here? Um, the, those uh, cast members, feel free to go off camera if you like. Uh, have a little bio break. Grab a little water. But Jeremy, stick around. Um, and those of you in the chat, we will get to, uh, we will get to chat with... Jeremy Frazier, uh, who is uh, as outstanding a narrator as he is a D and D player. Um, <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, welcome, Jeremy. I'm so I cannot tell you how happy I am that you're here. Um, Jeremy uh, and I met a while ago and bonded over a shared love for D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. um, so I am thrilled that you're here. Uh, chat, uh, as you think of questions that you'd like to ask Jeremy, go ahead and throw them in there. Uh, but let me get things rolling off, Jeremy, uh, just sort of by asking you, like, what was your path to becoming an audiobook narrator? What, what, what led you into this field? Uh, I have always been a performer but all through school and a little past that i was a musician sax player um, but i've always loved performing uh, and i did my last career was musical instrument repair and, and i got from performing so much just didn't get a chance to especially with having kids i ran out of time uh, in the day so i was looking for something more to that i would be inspired by again because i kind of lost that in the work that i was doing mm -hmm. And uh, my wife actually suggested looking into uh, voice acting. And I said, that sounds terrible. I don't like that at all. <laughs> so a couple of weeks later, I started looking into voice acting because it seemed interesting. And then right away, she was like, you know, you love audiobooks. Um, you love listening to them. You're, you're great to listen to. You should look into audiobooks. And I said, no, that's a terrible idea. That's way too much work. I could never do that. So a couple weeks later, I found ACX and started looking into audiobooks because it seemed like a good idea. Um, I s tried out for a few books on ACX. I got a couple 45-minute uh, books, and I just enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun, and I went, okay, yeah, this I can spend some time doing. 
Um, so decided if I was going to do it, I was going to take it serious. Uh, signed up with Sean Pratt and went through his whole course over two and a half years. And, uh, yeah, just went at it. Right on. What was uh, what was it that you liked so much about it? What 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 was it that sort of uh, rang that bell for you? I love the storytelling. I love getting involved in the new world and finding out uh, just in in fiction the world that's there, the rules, the everything that's happening there, and how it's different. Uh, I love getting into the characters and really thinking about how they're feeling and how they are going to react into different situations, and and really trying to get into that. Nice. Uh, yeah. the, Matthew LeMay from the chat is saying that he's a fellow sax player. Uh, so l let me ask on his behalf, like, what, what is your, what's your favorite music to play? Uh, either genre or is there a particular piece that does it for you? Uh, I like, I, I was a huge fan of the summer of ska back in the 90s. Uh, I, I played in a ska band, oh God, would have been 10 years ago now. So I love that. I love playing and all small ensemble stuff, jazz, music, blues, anything, all that kind of stuff. Nice. Uh, Rachel, and I'm a very sax player, specifically. Rachel is asking, what's the hardest book that you've narrated so far? Um, hardest book that I've narrated? Yeah. Uh, so I do, I did a series um, called Paranoid Mage. And the, the author is, is great, has a fabulous vocabulary, but just brings in a lot of words that I'm like, I have, I've never seen that word before at all. And just, and weaves them in so effortlessly into what he's writing. But I, I definitely learned a lot of words from that book, <laughs> from the whole series. Right on. Um, and I know you have a lot of lit RPG under your belt. What, what is it that draws you to that genre in particular? Um, I think the same kind of stuff that uh, brings me to D and D. It's um, for those that don't know, lit RPG is kind of uh, the idea is it's a role playing game, whether it's something like tabletop D and D or kind of like video games, anything like that, where most of the time our main character is kind of dropped into that system, and they go from just being a normal guy walking down the street, and suddenly we've got to figure out these skills that we have and how this is how we're going to level things up and and gain xp and all of that kind of stuff and it's very similar in D D with leveling up and fun skills so it's really really fun nice um now i i was curious because i i uh i mean i know from when when we met that you're an avid D D player uh do you find any sort of resonance between uh, playing role-playing games and narrating. Like, do you find that playing RPGs enhances your narrating, or your narrating enhances your RPG experience? Yeah, yeah. Um, you're having to be in character uh, when you're playing D and D, and it's a lot more spontaneous. So you're really having to focus on how focus on how does this character work, what are they going to do, and reacting to that, and trying to play through as quickly as you can, which helps when you're in in the book. And you've got multiple characters and you're playing through and you start to go, oh, no, this is this is going to be the way that they're going to deliver these lines. And this is how they're going to go back and forth in this scene. Yeah. Uh, so Math great. Matthew from the chat is asking if there's a favorite D&D &D class race that you like playing. Uh, I play a lot of Paladin. I play a bit of Cleric. Mostly I like to play the tank. I like to be the the big person up front taking the hits, and even when I've played monks and uh, characters that go down faster, I have had many times where I will run ahead and make sure that I am in the front, <laughs> <laughs> taking all the damage, protecting people. Outstanding. That 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 feels like a very dad thing to do. I, yeah, I like to yeah. do the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, everybody is is coming back now, so let me just ask you uh, one last question before the rest of the group comes back. Um, uh, is there a book you've narrated that has really stuck with you, right? Like, um, I, 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 I hate asking, like, is there a favorite book? Because, cause it, it, you know, often, you know, the, the, the our favorites are, are often the one we're doing right now, no matter what it is. But some books live longer than others in, in our spirits. So is, is there a book that you've narrated that's really sort of stuck with you? Um, I think 
that I, I definitely auditioned for a lot of different romance because it's a popular genre, but I never really got into it. I never really cared. Um, it was, you know, just a book to read. Mm -hmm. And then I did a book called The Place Between, which is a tropey adversaries to lovers um, book. And by the end of that, like I was invested in the characters. I, I was waiting for them to get together. Like they had to, it was a whole um, fake dating thing for work. And like, I was, you knew where it was going, but like I was actually invested in it. And I got to the end, I was like, oh, okay, no, I, this I can enjoy. And so I've focused a bit more on looking at that kind of stuff when I've looked at romance because I actually got into that. Nice. Nice. Uh, and as we uh, as we come back from chat, Rachel, if you could if you could bring everybody back, uh, let me just let me just ask you, uh, Jeremy, if, if we want to hear more of your narration uh, and you all should want to hear more of Jeremy's narration. Uh, is there a particular book that you'd like to uh, like to encourage people to go check out right now? Um, just recently came out Road to Mastery by Valerios, published by Athon Books. Uh, and for those that like value, for one credit, you get over 30 hours of lit RPG. Nice. And I think we've got a link for that in the uh, in the description down below. So everybody should go <laughs> check that out. Uh, and now that everyone is uh, is back, let's uh, let's return to punch and roll. Um, so here we are in this little uh, break room uh, uh, with the characters taking a break along, along with us players. Um, if anyone who wants to take a short break certainly can um, do those, uh, uh, mm. take uh, any hit dice you might want to roll, go ahead, uh, reset any abilities that need resetting. As you do get uh, an uninterrupted hour as you are catching your breath and patching your wounds here in this side room so i don't have magic but that that would reset your count of spells or, or mp uh, it, or? It, it varies by class uh some classes reset on a short rest others reset on a long rest and uh i'm i'm not right off the top uh uh know who does what but i know that dnd beyond will track all that for you okay uh, for so future while we're, characters for me. <laughs> yeah. Just bookmarking that in my mind. While we're hanging out, El Torn will look around the uh, the room to see if there's any sort of papers or maybe orders, uh, maps, or anything like that in the room that might be uh, might be helpful. Sure. Maybe books. Yeah, unfortunately, mm. this is a pretty spare room. Uh, it looks like this really was just <laughs> used as a, as a little resting place. There's a, there's a little cobalt-sized chamber pot in the corner that's a little smelly. Why they didn't just use the sewer, who knows? Uh, maybe one of them was the sort that, you know, doesn't pee in the swimming pool. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but there's that and really nothing else. Okay. But there is that other door further ahead down the yes. sewer. Are you all ready to pack it up and move on? Ready to press on? Oh, and while um, also in that hour, El Torin has totally cleaned his robes with his prestidigitation and is now clean again. Right on. El Torin, gonna... I couldn't help but notice you're very fastidious about your robes. Is there a reason for that? Neatness keeps me safe. Hmm. Well, as I know, looks can also be deceiving. Well, Alfgar, who is not great with people, will just say, right, can you do me too? Oh, <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, uh, get Elfgar's hands and... All right, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, all right, I guess let's uh, let's keep going. All right. Now, now that you are nice and clean, you are descending once more into the sewer. So outstanding. It's fun. <laughs> it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. Keep my hands up in the air to try to keep them as clean as long as possible. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so another 30 feet down the sewer brings you to that other small door in the side. Oh, let's do Julie. Let's check this one, too. We, we cannot be too careful. So I'll go ahead and do a... Perception? No, investigation. 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 All right, let me check this door first. Hang on, hang on. All right, Calden has, has rolled an 11 investigation. It does not seem to be trapped or locked. Does anybody else want to take a look at it? Uh, it seems okay. 
I'll open it if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, it, it swings open, uh, and there is a small flight of stairs that lead down into a larger room, uh, perhaps 50 by 50, uh, well lit, mm. with some sconces on the walls, uh, with lanterns hanging down, providing uh, a bright light in this entire room. Um, the room itself is full of these small mismatched desks. Uh, many of them, the, the sort of desks that you, you, you may have had like in, in elementary school, right? The sort of chair with like mm. the little half desk on one side and a couple of them are on the left-hand side for lefties. Um, there, there might at most be two or three that are alike uh, as perhaps 20 of them are scattered throughout this room. Wow. They're all arranged facing a sidewall on which a piece of slate has been mounted with something written in draconic on it. Above that slate are um, seemingly just sort of somehow stuck together pieces of parchment uh, haphazardly draped across the top of that slate on which in rather questionable handwriting are largely painted the letters, both, um, both capital and lowercase of the common alphabet. Mm. There is uh, 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 on the far side uh, of this room, there is uh, another wooden door. And it, looks like, it looks like a classroom. Can anybody read that? What's on the board? Yeah, what, what uh, El Torn can read Draconic, so he will read what's on the board. And I think, Miscrea, you said you can read Draconic as well, right? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, El Torn, it says, Mr. Skizix. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Skizix. This does it indeed appear Mr. to be a classroom. Skizzix? I mm -hmm. see. Hmm. El Torin, as they go down into the room, will start making sure all the desks line up and they're a nice, <laughs> ordered, neat pattern as best, as best he can with so the El Torin, uh, Make, as you, <clears throat> as you arrange these desks, uh, make a stealth check for me, please. Fifteen. Nice. Um, so in, in, instead of accidentally getting some loud squealing sound <laughs> as you adjust them, you sort of are, you're very carefully picking them up oh, yes. and making sure they're aligned precisely. Um, uh, so he's paying attention. He's now sort of making sure that these desk prep. What are you going for? Like a like a like a straight rectangular grid pattern? Oh yes, yeah, as as uh, equidistant as possible, front to side. Right. So on. everything is perfectly aligned with the front and then spaced appropriately. And on some of these desks are sitting sort of small, uh, cheaply bound books. Hmm. Or right, take a flip through one of those. Well, you're, you've got quite an adjustment to go through here. The, the desks are very <laughs> haphazard. So let, let, let's let some other folks do some stuff before you're... I was gonna say, right. say out loud while Elterin is, is adjusting these, um, you, or, or ask the group, did, did the old guy upstairs tell us what kind of books went missing? I'm going to open the books and look at them. Are they in Draconic? Uh, they are. Uh, well, actually, um, th they're not in Draconic. Um, and Though in answer to your question about the books, he never specified. Uh, a lot of books have gone missing uh, over, the, over mm. the last year. Mm. The books themselves, uh, Ulfgar, as you open them up, seem to be... Uh, primers, like very basic primers that you might use to teach a child uh, their letters. Um, there are pages where you're supposed to copy letters. Uh, at the back, they're like the C. Jane, right? Hmm. It's, uh, you know, C. Jane dance, uh, C. Jane learn how to wield a sword, C. Jane run from a dragon, right? Stuff like that. Um, it, they're all pretty badly filled in. Uh, the handwriting is sloppy. A lot of the letters are backwards or upside down. Um, it's, it's not not the most skillful of students seem to be in this classroom. Mm. See, I Jane, learn uh, how to take, turn a serpent into a sandwich. Indeed. <laughs> I don't imagine these out of the books they're looking for. I don't think so. You know, many, many moons ago, I learned to read from one of these by myself. It feels wrong somehow. Nice. It just seems. I hope. I hope we didn't just kill Mr. Skizix up there. Uh, 
Right, you that might help? be a good time to say maybe we don't kill everything we come across just in case they happen to be students, uh, Keldin. <laughs> Guilty as charged. At this point, you guys begin to hear some muffled sounds coming from the other side of that door. Um, can't really make out the words. Uh, just a... But there seems to be some sort of um, argument going on on the other side of that door. The door we came in? No, or the, the, door? the door on the far side. Okay. Do you guys hear the that? What side. is that? Can we take a listen at the door? Maybe. I'm sorry, Ray. Right. Ray, what did you say? Just go take a listen at the door. Yeah, give me a perception check. I'm going to pull my hammer. My little plastic Ooh, hammer, apparently. That 20. Wow. <laughs> All right. No. So you hear, what you hear uh, is unmistakably the sound of an instructor reading somebody the riot act. Right? It's like, your disruptions in this classroom make learning very difficult for other children. Why do you have to insist on making noise and, and prowling pranks and telling jokes? This is serious business that we are engaged in. How are we supposed to help the great one to feel better if all you do is make people oh, laugh and what's make he people saying? just on and on what's like this, intraconic? <laughs> what is that? What's he saying? It sounds like we have found Mr. Skizix, was it? Mm -hmm. Mr. Skizix seems to be instructing a I see. Uh, Oh, Scott, put the hammer away. What are you doing? It's, it's, it's students, a teacher. What is he teaching? Uh, Discipline. <laughs> <laughs> We need to be careful. I don't. I want. I don't want to scare them, startle them into attacking us. We need to handle this situation with some finesse. I think. I don't All speak right. the language, though. Can anybody else take the point I, on this? Yes. I don't suppose you want to bring them finger sandwiches. <laughs> uh, all right. So I guess um, if we're not just going to leave. We could just leave if this we is. We could just leave, but um, they still are fixing talking when I'm not about, actually leaving. Still though. talking about the Great One, which that one kobold said when he was attacking. There we go. So this Great One could be the one stealing the books. Perhaps Through that door they're... might be the way we need to go. And he could be teaching from a stolen book as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, El we could open the door and rush him in here. El Torn will knock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you uh, you hear um, uh, the same voice say, um, "Yes, yes, just one second. <laughs> uh, and you hear some uh, th something, and you hear uh, and um, and uh, the door swings open, and you see before you. Um, Two kobolds, uh, one uh, younger, um, sort of, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, two or three inches shorter than the other uh, with a, a sort of a sullen expression on their face. Uh, and you can see actually uh, on their, their knuckles are kind of uh, reddened. Um, <laughs> and the other kobold is holding in their hand a, a, a metal ruler um, uh, and looks at you and there's a blinking moment where they're mentally adjusting that this is not a kobold they're looking at, but a, a bunch of humanoids. And while while in, there, in that moment, um, El Torn, Master Skizix, I'm sorry to interrupt your class, but we are looking to recover the library's books. Would you happen to know where they may be? Make a persuasion roll, but at disadvantage. Disadvantage? I even speak the language. You speak right. the language, but you are not a kobold. <laughs> Oof. One of those would have been better. Oh. So there is this <laughs> moment, um, and the teacher yells, I want to take the books! And uh, please roll initiative. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I knew I should have taken that ruler. In that moment, I was going to take that ruler. No corporal punishment here. Oh, That's an 11 for Miss Grian. Which doesn't mean that you have to fight them, but it does mean that maybe they're trying to fight you. Right. Um, 
A six. Calden rolled a four. Again, this guy is not ready for battle. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to fix this window again. So All right. Like so the me first right. thing that happens is actually that uh, younger one in the back, um, looking at you with with big wide eyes, uh, who reaches into a pocket oh, and produces. Oh, doesn't reach into a pocket. Actually, uh, pushes forward and sticks out their hand to you. Uh, uh, El Torin, as if trying to shake your hand. Um, <laughs> does a 20 hit your armor class? Yes, it does. All right. And I'm imagining perhaps that's because uh, in in the uh, the peacemaking role you're trying to play, you, you maybe even stick your hand out. Uh, <laughs> and he grasps your hand, and you have just time enough to notice there's something actually in his hand before you feel this bzzz, buzzing sound. <laughs> And you take two points of lightning damage as a hand Classic buzzer trick. is set off on your hand. And you are actually, the electricity running through your body has paralyzed you until the end of your next turn. With a twist. Uh, right. Classic with a twist. Classic with a twist. Uh, your next turn is now, though. Uh, bad news, you can't do anything on this turn because you're paralyzed. But good news, uh, as your turn ends, you're no longer paralyzed. Uh, but you're not able to take an action this turn. Uh, Ulfgar, what do you want to do? Uh, I'm going to push... I, I want to push into the out of this room. Into the hallway that they're in? Or the room that they're in? Uh, yeah, they're in a sort of a smaller room. It's got sort of an office-y feel. There's a desk, some posters on the wall, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to say in common, right, there's no need for that. Let's just calm down and talk it out. And I'm going to take defensive action. Okay. Uh, uh, make a persuasion check, but again at disadvantage. That's a two. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Afraid the weapon in your One hand is, is speaking better than uh, speaking louder than the words out of your mouth. Uh, Miscrea. Uh, you are up. It's getting a little crowded in that doorway with uh, with two kobolds and two of your party members crammed in there. What do you want to do? Oh, jeez. Okay. Um... As long as you have a blunt weapon, I think you can make an attack with the uh, intent to disable rather than kill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, uh, the rule on the... that is as long as you're attacking, making as long as you're making a melee attack, um, and you don't have to declare it uh, at the beginning, right? If, if if I tell you after a melee attack you killed somebody, you can say, no, 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 I just wanted to knock him out. You don't need to even declare it ahead of time. Hmm. Oh. That's good to know. Um, well, I, can I use my shield to kind of, like, bonk it? Because, like, like uh, using the shove, using, like, the shove. <laughs> sure, just trying to, sh trying to shove that cobalt teacher yeah, back Yeah, because we still want to talk to it. Yeah. yeah, sure, go ahead. Make, a, make a, an athletics check, and it's going to be contested by the cobalt instructor's acrobatics to see if they can get out of your way. Athletics check, and that is a 14. And that certainly beats their 7. So you should come in with that shield, and, and the cobalt just sort of uh, staggers back uh, uh, five or six feet and bumps uh, into the back of their desk. All right. I guess that was that's your my action. turn. Is there anything else yeah. you want to do? That's it. Okay. Uh, now we come around to the kobold instructor, uh, just shoved, uh, who... Um, <laughs> who is going to stare at you, Miss Kriya, for the, the uh, audacity of shoving a teacher, looks at you, and gives you a little noise. Yeah, one of those, absolutely. <laughs> and you begin to feel the shame. You begin to feel the shame of shoving a teacher <laughs> as the teacher uses their scolding glare against you. Please make a wisdom saving throw. Wisdom saving throw... Wisdom saving. Th found it. That is a I feel like 16. This should be a resistant. That is a 16. Good, you good. are resistant. Yes, you do resist uh, the scolding glare. Uh, <laughs> you you do feel some shame come up, uh, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't have any bad effects. Um, and that is the cobalt instructor's turn, which brings us to Calden. 
At long last. <laughs> um, <laughs> Calden is noticed and, and remembers that there was some uh, common in the text, although he does not speak draconic, was it? Nope. I'd, I, he'd like to shove past towards where the instructor is. I assume the instructor's in the office. Mm-hmm. So through the doorway, hands up, uh, saying one of the most simple words, which is stop, 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 stop. So I'm hoping to make a, some type of persuasion or uh, whatever whatever check you think that would be to de-escalate the situation. Uh, persuasion indeed, but again, we're going to have to make it a disadvantage. Yeah. Disadvantage. Uh, okay, that will be... My actual, my fake dice are in the way. I think it's 11. <laughs> the, okay. the uh, animation rolled in front. Yeah. It's an 11. It's an 11. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, so they're sort of looking at you, uh, but haven't really seemed to let their uh, uh, defensive Guard posture down. down. Uh, and that brings us back to the top of the order for that, uh, that kobold troublemaker uh, who uh, is going to reach into another pocket and what does he pull out? Nope, he used that last time. Got to re-roll that one. Uh, he pulls out, oh, oh, it's crowded in here. Eh, he doesn't <laughs> care. He's going to do it anyway. Uh, out of another pocket, he pulls out this glass jar that is f just you. He, that is full of these swarming insects. It's a regular and Bart Simpson, this kid. smashes it down on the ground, releasing the jar of bees. I would oh, like everybody in this room to make a constitution saving throw, please. Is it against poison? Uh, oh, Miss Gria rolled a three. Yes. Three is a fail. Keldon has rolled an feeling. eight. That's a fail. 13. Okay. 13 is a pass. 22. 22 is a pass. Uh, the chat is very excited that there are bees now for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> chat bees. seems to love bees. They would be. So these are very uh, aggressive bees doing oh, four boy. points of poison damage and two points of piercing damage. So those of you who failed, you take six points of damage. Uh, those of uh, you who succeeded, you only take three. No oh, drat. The bees. And I have to, oh, we have to do that for uh, the kobolds as well, since they're in the room. Uh, the teacher. Kill his teacher with this. So he's got to get teacher. Where did the teacher's role go? Oh, the game log disappeared on me. Uh, the teacher, uh, I'm just going to say the teacher failed. Uh, and the troublemaker succeeded. So the troublemaker takes. Trained bees. Trained bees, yeah. And the teacher takes. Six. Okay. And El Torin, it's your turn now. Are those bees seem like they're going to stick around? It was seems to have been a burst of anger as they were released, stinging anything in their presence. And now they seem to sort of be trying to make their way out of the room. Uh, a couple leaving by the door, others sort of buzzing around the ceiling, testing out the corners. Uh, but uh, the ones who were going to stung uh, <laughs> have stung, and the others seem to be trying, just trying to get out of there. And so They're a spell, bees, you know, spell attack can't be uh, can't be non-lethal. Uh, weirdly, a melee spell attack can be. Okay. Well, then um, El Torn will reach down and um, return the favor a little bit. The sparks will arc across the tips of his fingers as he grabs for the troublemaker to okay. try to use a shocking grasp. All right. Oh, indeed, returning the the favor. Mm -hmm. Turnabout. At a nineteen. That hits. Uh, six, uh, damage. Wow. Okay. Yeah! Um, as, uh, the six damage, but that's not enough to bring this kobold down. Anything else you want to do? Uh, that'll be it. Okay. Let's see. Brings and us not to wearing Ufgar. armor made of metal, right? Yep. And no. can't, uh, the troublemaker can't take reactions until the start of his next turn. Right on. All right, Ufgar, you are up. Uh... I'm going to shove the troublemaker down to the ground. Well, I'm going to try. Okay. Uh, so a trip attack against the troublemaker. Uh, go ahead and uh, roll, I think it is, an athletics check. Contested by it's going to be his acrobatics. Okay. 18. Uh, against a 16. So you, you nice. sweep your leg or, or your hammer, <laughs> and uh, the troublemaker whoop, whoop, goes down in a heap on the floor. I want to 
just kind of lord over him and point straight at his face and make, oh, now you knock that off and lie there. <laughs> <laughs> Get in. I'll t- tell you, finger in the face feels like pretty universal mm-hmm. uh, thing. So make an intimidation roll, uh, straight up roll, no disadvantage on that one. Three. Oh, three. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, perhaps, perhaps this Dice guy love has, me today. has. Perhaps this is not the first bit of aggressive discipline this teenager has faced. Um, Rolls and, his uh, eyes. Yeah, it's like whatever, <laughs> Dad. Whatever. <laughs> uh, Miss Kriya, what are you gonna do? All right. So as I'm clutching one of my bee stings over here, I go, "Hey, okay, we don't want to hurt you. We want to talk to you. Can I do a persuasion?" Uh, do you, uh, do you know, you don't do it chronic, right? This is just in common? Just in common, yeah. Yeah, so at disadvantage. At disadvantage. I thought you did know draconic. I thought you... Mm. Yes, you're not the first person that said that, but no, I don't. Oh. Mm. I must have overheard the rumors and yeah, slander. All right, that's a 10. Yeah, do- doesn't seem to be as effective. Oh, by the way, the chat is asking, what is a bee's favorite song? The answer to which is Staying a Hive by the Bee Gees. <laughs> um, so now we come along to the kobold instructor who um, hmm, uh, is, I'm going to take a suggestion from the chat. Oh, boy. Um, they, uh, you were... Uh, uh, called and I think sort of trying to, yeah, to uh, hands to, up de-escalating. To put your hands up, sort of de-escalating. But I've also been stung, so I'm like. And <gasps> uh, he he looks at you, uh, and says, "You, you're a good boy, not <laughs> like the others." As they use <laughs> the teacher's pet ability on you, trying to charm you. <laughs> <laughs> so make please a wisdom saving throw. Uh, the charm strikes again. Uh-huh. The wisdom saving throw is a 19. Ooh. Not today, <gasps> Satan. Yeah, you are not <laughs> persuaded by this teacher to turn against your friends. <laughs> um, and that brings us to your turn, Calden. Oh, boy. Um, I guess I just, I gotta try, I don't want to resort to more violence, so I, I think I'm gonna try to persuade Intimidation's not going to work. I have a higher persuasion than I have intimidation, so I think that's probably the way to well, go. It seems like intimidation might be able to do straight roll rather than disadvantage. That's a good point. Um, you know what? Just for the sake of, of good good RP, let's do an intimidation roll. I've been stung by bees. I'm done talking. So uh, I'd like to... Um, <laughs> this kid's obviously it's a sour apple, so oh, I'd like to pull a knife and sort of put it down. Stop it. That that type of thing. Is the stop knife, stop knife, resisting. Knife going at the instructor? Or at the instructor, the... not the kid. Okay, make the intimidation check. That will be a four. Fact, you know what? I'll let, since, you, since you shrugged off their ability to charm, I'll let you make it at advantage. Okay, that is a mercy <laughs> that you've given me. Uh, all right. Oh, that which means I should just roll one more. Yeah, just roll one more. Okay, I almost, almost did a double here. So the next one will be a 10. Yeah, uh, they, I'll say on a 10, uh, they don't stop fighting, they don't drop their ruler, but they do seem to be having second thoughts about their... Uh, the wisdom of fighting people who can so easily shove, push, trip them around and don't <laughs> seem to be charmable. So you're getting somewhere, uh, but you haven't you haven't disarmed him yet. Uh, meanwhile, the troublemaker down on the ground um, with you being you sort of standing over uh, is going to desperately uh, grab into another pocket. Whoop, that's Ooh. not the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. And they pull out uh, a, uh, a tiny little, uh, sort of a baby skunk comes out of one of their pockets and they I like throw that, but... this skunk out. Uh, and the skunk, being terrified, uh, lets out a of uh, of odor right uh, right at uh, right at you Ulfgar uh, so a constitution saving throw please against uh, poison I, mean, I, guess, I guess this does count as poison so well let me ask you this did we knock the troublemaker out 
No. No, just oh, knocked down I on the ground. Oh, I thought that he was sort of incapacitated for the... For, whoops. No. I got no. a 19. Yeah, so you are not uh, not incapacitated by that skunk. And the troublemaker now uh, rolls over onto hands and knees and begins crawling, trying to get under y'all's legs to escape <laughs> out the door. And he's small enough that he can do that, although anyone who wants to can take an opportunity attack at him as he crawls I'm doing by. It. Yeah, go for it. And with advantage because he's crawling on the ground? Uh, Sure. Oof. That's Oof. a crit. That's a nice. net 20. That 20. Yeah, do your crit uh, damage, so damage double the dice. Yet. That should be sufficient, That's I should think. Five. Oh. That's a five on the crit. <laughs> oh, Very like accurate. accurate but... <laughs> oh, not not sufficient that hit, but anybody else can take one as he as he begins to crawl away. And just to be clear, these are non-lethal. If we want them to be. Yeah, again, you don't have to declare that un unless I okay. tell you he's died. Well, I don't see any reason to to let him scamper away. Sure. Yeah, go for it. So, let's see. I should roll. I I suppose my daggers would be the thing, right? Sure. All right. Oh, and I forgot to roll them at advantage, but it probably doesn't matter because that's a 20. That hits, and you do get to use your sneak attack. And I do get to use the sneak attack. So, mm -hmm. let's see. The first will be a 1, and the sneak attack, let me jump over there, will be a... Four. So five damage five total. all day. Uh, not enough to bring it down. Uh, Miscrea and El Torin, you also get to make one if you want. All right, might as Should well. Should I follow this up with a two weapon? You Is can't. that possible you for can't a, um, on a not on an opportunity? Attack. Opportunity. Okay. You just get the one. All right. Well, I got my scimitar handy, so. This is one tough kobold. Yeah, we've been smashing That's him with the butt of our weapon. Thirteen hits. <laughs> Okay. Juvenile delinquents are hard to bring down. And that's a seven <laughs> damage. Uh, seven, not enough to bring this kobold Still? down. Although wow. You can almost, oh, you know. almost see the stars reeling in his eyes All as right. he gets one last burst of speed to try to escape. Colin, right. it seems to be El up to you. Or El Torin, yeah. Oh, El Torin, right. All right, well, let's see. And still with advantage, right? Yes. Because he's uh, prone. Whack him right, with a blunt end of that thing. That hits. I don't Golf know if I do any swing. damage, though. <laughs> no, it's this is. Oh, wait, no, no, no. I should be able to do better than this. I have a I, staff. I, I think Hold minimum, on a second. I think, uh, I'm going to say unarmed strikes are a minimum of one. I don't. I don't like the zero unarmed strikes. Zero. <laughs> yeah. but, unarmed strike. No, I, should, is, I, is I do a have massage? a I do have a staff though, no, which isn't the, on my. He only like had one turn. hit point left, so it's it's <laughs> okay. it's ultimately uh, ultimately moot. Dunk. As uh, let's say he was on the on the wrong side of you to get with the staff, so you just sort of reach out with Cuffed your him. foot and claw his his head, and he mm. rolls. Rolls over uh, unconscious onto the ground uh, with uh, with the kobold. Whoops, not a hundred points of damage. One point of damage, uh, and that brings us to El Torin. It is your turn. All right. Well, let's um, let's go ahead and uh, I guess uh, El Torin will put his staff on the uh, the unconscious. Um, on the unconscious troublemaker's back and then try to, again, intimidate the instructor. We don't need anyone else to die. And uh, we'll try an intimidation. Oh my... <laughs> <laughs> this, this instructor, yeah. hard. Uh, uh, the instructor is clearly feeling that he is the only one <clears throat> who gets to engage in corporal punishment on his students. <laughs> Not a big fan, but Ulfgar, uh, you are up next. Yeah. <laughs> this point, just knock him out. <laughs> so I look up from the troublemaker that's down, look at the the teacher, look at everybody else, and I go, yeah. And I'm gonna smash him with a hammer. <laughs> 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 and that's a twenty. That cool. is. Oh wow. wow. <laughs> and now I'll There's hit him for damage. seven. All right. Still up. Anything else you want to do? No. Miss Kriya. Well, I guess I'll give the look like, right? Right? <laughs> uh, I mean, he's not listening. <laughs> You've got one. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think we just got to follow your lead at this point, and I'm going to raise my scimitar. 
And that is a 22. That hits. See, the attacks we can roll well on. The, uh, mm. the yeah. social skills. We're, we're not, not so sweet much. talking as much as we're <laughs> used to. And lacking. that's a five damage. <laughs> All right, five damage. Uh, not enough to bring him down. But we're, uh, we're bringing him down, but we're not bringing him yeah, down. Pretty badly hurt, <laughs> but not not knocked out. It is now his turn. Let's see if he gets his scolding glare back. No, no recharge on the scolding glare. Yeah, um, no, I'm scolding so you. he uh, he's just going to reach out and actually try to whack um, uh, El Toro. Not a big fan of you kicking his <laughs> student, so he's going to try to wrap you on the knuckles with his uh, steel ruler. That is an eleven to hit. That does not do it. Yeah, you knock it away with your staff, uh, and that brings us to uh, to Calden. Hmm. Um, okay, I'm going to try a different tack. I'd like to take out the coin that okay. Elturin threw me earlier, the which I haven't coin. had the chance to use yet. Yeah. And say, again, wait, 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 wait. Just some information. So I'm going to uh, try again, foolishly, an ill-fated persuasion, which should be a disadvantage, right? Yes, indeed. Okay. Let's just hope I get lucky. It's a 12. Yeah, 12, not enough to turn him away. Well, okay. And then in that case, it's like, okay. So Cal yeah. uh, Calden would like to just sort of back up. All right. And that brings <laughs> us to a sort of symbolic. <laughs> <laughs> Giving right. up on the persuasive. All this right. This is what yeah. you've chosen. So uh, El Torn will, will uh, he's right there, will reach out, sparks across the fingers again, and uh, try to grab the... Uh, uh, grab the instructor. All right. No, not going to do it. Seven. Yeah, seven doesn't do. He skitters out of your way. Uh, he's been hit by that hand buzzer one too many times. He, he knows what's coming. Uh, and that brings us around to Ulfgar. I'm going to hit him. Okay. <laughs> do what you guys. Ulf, take him. Take so 14. this guy. 14 hits. And let's see. Oh, yeah, I'll do another seven. Seven, not quite enough to bring him down, but he's looking <laughs> pretty bad. Oh uh, man! Let's mystery us see if you can do oh, it. Oh gosh! Oh, okay, yeah, I, I might as well just hit him as well. We we want to talk to him, but we got to get him down first. So yeah. that's a twenty-two. That hits. And I slash with six damage. And he has five hit points left. So how do you knock him out? I get. <laughs> I, since I don't want to kill him, I just take the handle and I bunk it on his head. Right. Uh, so right on the top of his head, and you <clears throat> see him turn to you to give you a scolding, finger up, <clears throat> opening his mouth, and just go, <sighs> and falls <laughs> sideways down uh, You know, I was floor. a teacher's pet for a long time. <laughs> Too bad I couldn't be one for you. <laughs> and, uh, and you guys are now out of initiative, having uh, knocked unconscious these two kobolds. And you can take a beat and finally take in the room about you. Um, the desk is very, very messy, with several books and papers scattered across it. An apple sits on the desk. Uh, and there are three posters. Um, there is a, a, a very old poster, um, uh, weather-beaten, uh, yellowed with age, but it's advertising a used book sale from the great library's early days when it needed to, to raise funds. There is another poster that is providing a stern warning about the curses that can be placed on those who fail to return library books in a timely manner. <sighs> and on the far wall is something quite different. An enormous painting of a fearsome-looking blue dragon, massive horn on its head, yellow eyes that speak of a penetrating and yet wicked intelligence, lightning arcs off of its razor-like claws as it soars above a blasted landscape of sand and rock. The painting has a brass plaque underneath it that reads, Istingul of the Earth's Lord Dread. And this 
is where we're going to take our break. And we will uh, end tonight's adventure here with two kobolds down and the visage of a blue dragon staring down upon you. No uh, poster of a kitten saying, hang in there? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure there wasn't a fourth one well, in there? Maybe, maybe this is the kobold version of the poster with a kitten. Who knows? <laughs> uh, but thank you all, everybody. Thank you, everybody in the chat for joining us. Uh, thank you to our new players for coming uh, and, and adding to the glorious chaos that is Punch and Roll. Uh, Yay. We we will be back in two weeks to continue this adventure. Uh, thank you again to Panna, the Professional Audiobook Narrators Association, who you can learn more about at pronarrators.org. Um, in the meantime, everybody, keep these fantastic narrators in your ears. Uh, there's a link to Jeremy's book, Road to Mastery, in the video description below. Uh, and there are links to uh, many books by uh, by our fabulous uh, narrators. Lauren, I think you... Uh, you you uh, offered up a book. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little about the book uh, you'd like folks to listen to. So, well, this one is the newest release, um, released just this past weekend. It's called Desi and Kai Go Poof. It is a children's book. So for those of you who have children, it is a Spanglish adventure filled with talking parrots pirates and dinosaurs oh that's so, i love that it's a fun adventure that for children amazing. <laughs> uh, ray what about you uh so the book that i linked uh, was one actually it's not one of my new releases one i did a long time ago one of my favorites called uh, the great martian war invasion uh it is a sort of follow-up to hg wells war of the worlds where 10 years later the martians return and so it's a alternate history historic science fiction with historic characters like Teddy Roosevelt um, and a lot of period uh, characters as the uh, early 20th century humans try to fight off the Martian invasion with the uh, walkers and and uh, and all that stuff and it's so it's a it's a lot of fun and it's a series that I've done five books in now and wow. uh, I think they're wow. I think they're really great that sounds super cool yeah that sounds wildly fun yeah uh, Spencer mm -hmm. anything you want to uh, to to uh, draw people's eyeballs to or, or ear holes to sure uh, I've got a, a book this month seems to be doing surprisingly well I think it's part of like an indie horror um, book off uh, called Ooh. the Exorcist's house nice. I love me some indie horror I can't remember if I plugged that one last season, but it seems to be having a renaissance of sorts. So uh, it's great. It's not over the top extreme horror. It's sort of like the perfect kind of summer horror uh, uh, listen. So fabulous. Yeah, check it out if you're into that type of stuff. And I will uh, I will round things off by uh, kicking in some nonfiction uh, down in the description. I've got a link to a nonfiction book that is a survey of monsters across all different cultures and times, exploring what uh, what what monsters have in common and, and what this means about the sort of stories that we need to tell about them. Uh, so check those books out in the description below, and please come back in two weeks to uh, to see this this brave group of adventurers. Uh, Send further beneath the library and uh, like and subscribe and do all those lovely things. And we will see you back in two weeks. We'll be here Yay! and so will you. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. <laughs> Have a good night.